Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of IEEE Pune's podcast Beyond Conversations. Now today's episode is extremely special and unique because on today's episode we have with us Anandita Ghosh. She's a veteran journalist and a writer. She's worked as the features director of Vogue India and also as the editor of the Saturday magazine Mint Lounge. Recently in October 2021 She has released her first book The Illuminated which was published by Harper Collins India. Hello Anandita it's great to have you on our show Beyond Conversations. How are you today? I'm very good and it's great to be here with you Aditi. And it's so nice that an engineering college is doing you know conversations with writers that's quite interesting. <laughs> okay. So you've been a journalistic writer and a fiction writer for quite a long time when did you decide to pursue a career that was so creative i've only been a journalist for around 15 years my fiction career is rather uh, nascent aditi so my first book was out last year i've been working on it for 5 years but uh, i wouldn't say i've been a fiction writer for very long Uh so yeah John I graduated from Columbia's uh, journalism school in 2009 and I joined Mint Lounge as their kind of culture reporter and then I went to Vogue and then I joined Mint Lounge back as the editor so that's been that's been the bulk of my career and alongside that at some point I decided to complicate my life <laughs> right to work alongside you know after work hours uh editing jobs journalism jobs are you know they don't follow very fixed it's not a 9 to 5 job so right. pretty you know long 10 12 hour days but for some reason i decided to write a book between 12 and 2 every night so that i started doing that in 2015 and i finished in 2020 and it was out last year yeah did i answer your question don't know what your question i forgot what your question was okay my question was basically when did you decide to jump into this oh as a journalist well i always uh, You know just growing up I had a knack for writing English was my favorite subject in school I was terrible at maths uh, which might be hard for you know an engineering college student No okay. not at all But I must say so every male member of my family is uh, is an IIT and right my father went to IIT my brother went to IIT my cousins my uncle everyone and i don't know it's kind of gendered but all the women are like uh, english teachers or something like that so uh, i was really bad at maths uh, which was very disappointing for my father because for him uh, it doesn't matter if you do well in school if you're bad in maths uh, so i guess i had to work to my strengths which is what all right. of us do and language and writing was my strength Uh so I knew I wanted to do something related to writing and uh, mm-hmm. for a while I actually thought that would be advertising copywriting because it was you know as a as a 90s kid copywriting was a very attractive to, cool yeah. profession um but and I did I was I was quite you know a nerdy college kid so I did I think four internships in advertising and in my fourth internship my supervisor asked me when I was I think 19 so what do you want to do after you graduate and i was right. like uh, of course i want to be a copywriter I mean, why this is my yeah. first internship and he told me um that he thinks i would be better suited for journalism he said i think you're too idealistic for advertising and i was very upset with him because i you know was good at my job i was a hard working intern and i i took that very personally i took that to mean that i was not good at my internship but maybe there was some truth there so the next year i i was in a mass media undergrad so you have general you have a general program for the first two years and in the third year you have to pick between journalism and advertising so i okay. guess what he said despite my anger stuck with me and i picked journalism and um i guess you know it was a way to build a career out of doing something i like uh, which was writing uh so the options were kind of limited right if you want to build a career of writing you become a journalist you can be a copywriter you can be a film writer i guess um or you can go into academia so journalism was you know that's how it kind of uh, came up it did come uh, from the love of writing but also from the love of meeting 
new people getting to tell their stories traveling all of that i was always inclined towards feature journalism you know i haven't i didn't get into journalism thinking i want to be a war reporter or you know report right. the environment i did want to do culture feature stories interviews that's what i wanted to do and uh, it allowed me all of that so yeah okay and as you said you went to columbia university it's the columbia university is one of the most reputed institutions in the world so how did that come out and what was your experience of learning there it was quite interesting so you know how it is right i mean engineering is a four year program but for those yeah. of us who do a three year program you can't actually do a masters degree in the yeah. till you have another um, year yeah one bridge year yeah so um Honestly when I when I graduated from my mass media program with journalism mm-hmm. uh because it was in Bombay and Bombay is very you know kind of job savvy we all had these internships we had I had job offers I could have started working uh but I suddenly realized that you know mass media being a very broad based program you know you do six you do six months it's a semester system so you do six months of one subject and then you move on so when I graduated from this kind of professionally oriented program that was meant to get you jobs and i had jobs huh? but i suddenly felt that i hadn't studied i suddenly felt that i hadn't had an education so i actually enrolled for a masters program in bombay university in linguistics why i chose linguistics again i mean the honest answer would be i think i wanted to be contrarian that would be the honest answer <laughs> because i didn't really know what it was you know i was looking up programs and a lot of people i knew were going for a masters in literature or sociology mm-hmm. psychology i didn't know anyone who had studied linguistics that's the truth and it you know it was offering a program in linguistics and semiotics it's a science of yes. languages so i'm like okay i feel i haven't studied these 3 years mm-hmm. i was just working you know there were practical projects but there wasn't so much classroom education and i felt i missed out so let's study something completely new So when I started linguistics though I got really into it and I thought I should do a PhD in linguistics so that was the plan okay. uh when uh, when I graduated you know as I was finishing up my masters I was thinking of applying for some PhDs in linguistics but then I also thought uh, uh you know let's look around a bit so as I was doing those applications though I had a classmate who worked in Times of India who said hey you know there's a job opening at Times of India do you want to do this so I felt okay you know let me work for a year save some money and then I'll apply for the PhD so okay so my first journalism job actually happened in some very roundabout way I studied journalism mm-hmm. but then I studied linguistics and then this job just fell into me and then I really liked it you know so I worked in Times of India I think for close to 2 years and I liked it so much that I decided that you know let's study journalism properly and uh, it didn't make sense to i already had a masters degree it didn't make sense to study and apply to a second rate university it just didn't make mm. sense so i thought you know how people have backup colleges right right i didn't apply to any backup colleges because it didn't make sense i'm, I'm it like it was columbia or nothing no i applied to nyu as well okay But i did because i was confused i also did apply for a phd at the university of california so i i did do kind of a mix of things mm-hmm. uh, but when i got into columbia you know obviously it was firstly it was new york i think that was more the draw and it was <laughs> columbia so i think the choices were made i couldn't look at you know the phd or anything else and uh, i was really happy to be accepted i was 25 it was a great time to kind of be there it didn't end up though aditi being a great time to graduate because i graduated it was the global recession my course started in 2008 it finished in 2009 the idea of doing a masters program abroad is to get a kind of a professional exposure also it is to work there right even if it's for a bit but the job market was really bad when i graduated in 2009 okay. so that was disappointing uh, everybody i think most people all the international students from my batch mm-hmm. went back to their country so uh, that was a bit of a disappointment i feel i could have stuck around in new york but the jobs that i would have got would would not be uh, you know uh, 
would not kind of be even respectful of my degree. Like the kind of jobs I was getting in New York would not make sense for a Columbia journalism grad. Whereas Mm -hmm. India, the journalism market was thriving. Mint was a new paper then. It had just opened in 2006. And, you know, word got around. I didn't apply for a job. The Mint uh, lounge editor wrote Mm -hmm. to me saying, you know, do you want a job? So then I moved back to Delhi and that's how the Mint Lounge job happened. Uh, So, yeah, but Columbia was amazing. I just wish I could have stayed, you know, a year or two on the OPT visa and worked there a bit. I didn't get a chance to do that. Did you think the learning experience back here in India and in Colombia was different? Like you said that when you were doing your first degree, it didn't feel like you studied a lot. How was it different from studying in Colombia? Oh, you know, I'm a product of a very typical Indian education system, you know, where, I mean, I think these this whole idea of the IB, the IB schools, International Baccalaureate, they weren't around when I was growing up. So I went to an ICSE school. I was very good at rote learning. That didn't help me in maths. But I feel I somehow, I feel I even passed maths because I mugged up the sum. So that's how reliant I was on this system. And I did well in this system. I got 90 in my 10th standard. So I feel I... I did well in the Indian education system, but it's very different. So, you know, when you feel you're a good student in India and then you go to a place like Colombia, where (laughs) so much of it is analysis based and there's so much reading, we're simply not used to that, you know. So for me, um, because the course started, say, in summer, right, the course started in like June or July, they gave us the reading list for the first semester, like the books we were meant to buy Mm -hmm. and read uh, in April. And... I was busy shopping and saying bye-bye to people in April and May, whereas my other classmates were reading in April and May. They had read most of the coursework ahead of class. It's not something I even, I knew that I had to do. I I thought I was a good student and I would land up in Colombia and continue to be a good student. So it was a bit of a struggle, uh, just the volume of reading that Mm -hmm. we had to do. I mean, it was, we actually had to read like two two actual like two large like 300 page books a week and then say discuss it in class so you know it's not like just kind of looking at the you know the notes or kind of uh, you know the summary you're actually right. reading the original text and discussing it which mm-hmm. all my american classmates were used to doing for four years of their undergrad but the south asian students were not neither were the european students actually so it was hard, but it was wonderful. And it was, uh, you know, one and a half years, I think the most the most active, action-packed year of my life. It was fun. I would do it again if I could, but I would read the books in advance. <laughs> right. So it's been such an interesting journey. Even we're still just at the beginning of your journey. And it's such an interesting aspect of your life, how culturally you're speaking about how it was different between India and US. Uh, you mentioned the part where um, there weren't many job op- opportunities in the US and they weren't matching up to your potential and your degree. So a lot of people, especially in the tech industry, everyone speaks about how arts and humanities education does not uh, give you the opportunity to make enough money to support your family. It doesn't provide enough returns for the amount of education that you've been taking or the amount of talent that you have, the efforts you put in, uh, what has your experience been with this? I mean, I feel, Aditi, part of what you're saying, at least in the Indian context, might have been true um, 10 years ago, but I don't think it's true anymore, right? I mean, forget even arts and humanities, a social media influencer makes more money than most uh, you know, IT folks, right? So, so I don't think that's true anymore. I really think it's a it's a startup culture. It's it's really about um, also encouraging initiative, and uh, it honestly doesn't even matter what you study. It's some of my most successful friends. I mean, a lot of my very successful friends are college dropouts now, and they are, you know. Um, they are, I mean, successful in every uh, sense of the word. They are influencing lives, creating good products, making money. So I don't think that's true anymore. Yes, it was true in a de- when India was still, you know, when we could call it mm-hmm. a developing country and you needed to be 
a STEM person, you needed to be, you know, in medicine or architecture or yeah. doctor or later software to make it. And uh, humanity just meant you were going to be an underpaid teacher or an underpaid journalist. I don't mm. think that's true anymore. I think, you know, there's been a great kind of creative destruction and uh, um, you have to be good at what you do. So you can be... Um, you know, you can graduate from a top journalism college and work in a great paper and make decent money and a good life. And you can graduate from, you know, a second year engineering college, do a rubbish masters and work in a dead end job and not be a highly paid engineer. So I don't think that's true anymore. But uh, definitely, I think the choices are not as clear cut when you're in the humanities. Like if you're in a science or engineering stream, you know that you do your undergrad, then maybe you work for a bit, then you do a master's or you do an Mm. MBA, and then you work as a consultant. That's what most engineering grads do. right? So I feel the path is more clear cut. Whereas in humanities, I think the permutations and combinations are a little more fluid. So you need to be a little creative about how you're going to match those things and what you're going to make of it. Right. That's a really encouraging answer, considering that a lot of the Indian engineering population is people who have not uh, liked or studied anything that they're doing. I mean, coding (laughs) and all of it is completely otherworldly. And we feel like, oh my God, we're isolated out here and there's no way to be creative. But like you said, this is such an encouraging spot to be in, especially this place where your skill matters. Skill, initiative, I think your personhood, your individuality matters because you're kind of making those permutations. You're making a career out of something that maybe previously didn't exist, right? That day I saw on Instagram this woman who said she is a wedding proposal planner. Like she gets paid to plan other people's weddings. Like this is a completely made up job, you know, I'm right, right? but she's done and I think she's making money and she's successful and she's happy doing what she does. So I think we are living in an age when honestly you can be many things. So by, you know, I don't feel we need to subscribe to those old views. Yeah. Right. So coming back to your writing, you've written a lot of amazing features. What is your process of writing a feature? I think features are especially very interesting because they give you a lot of information as well as they give you perspective. They give you experiences of people. What was your uh, process of writing features particularly? How do you go about it? Uh, You know, that's a very broad uh, question and hence a broad answer. But I think it depends on the subject. So if you're doing a story on, say, the origin of coffee in India. I think it's really about first immersing yourself in research, seeing what other stories have been done, uh, you know, read as much as you can, prepare for the interviews, uh, pick three or four people who would be the correct voices for the story, Mm -hmm. interview them, and then kind of try to piece it together. But I think just just doing your due diligence, just starting off with good research is is the start point, yeah. Identifying good voices, good characters is also important. And then kind of the writing is what brings it together. Okay. Uh, Now you've spoken about interviews. So let's join the link there. Interviews, a very, very special aspect of your persona as a writer and a journalist. I think interviews, I mean, you've interviewed so many people from so many different professions. There have been actors, there have been architects, writers, um, internationally acclaimed people. Uh, What is your process of preparing for interviews? Now, this is something that's very, very important for us because we are preparing for interviews ourselves. Yeah, my process is, uh, you're not going to like the answer, but I'm very, very nerdy. I, I work really hard to prepare for the interviews. And I think Sometimes I'm almost envious, you know, my husband's a writer and suppose he's called to do a session. He'll just be like, ah, like on the way (laughs) we're driving, you know, on the way to the event, he'll look up something on the phone and he'll wing it. Right. I'm not a winger. I, I like if I have to interview a writer and that's the hardest because if the writer has written eight books, you have um, to go through all the eight books. And I feel really, really guilty if I don't read all the eight books. And it's not always possible. Like, you know, when, say, there's Jaipur Lit Fest, I've moderated there for a bit. And, you know, maybe you're interviewing four people. You're doing a panel. Uh, everyone, not everyone is a debut writer. So each person has written two, three books. 
um thankfully because i'm a good reader i've been doing this for a while i might have read some of it already but i'm really bogged down by guilt if i haven't seen every movie that this filmmaker has made read everything that this person has written uh so my preparation goes quite uh, it goes into a very kind of nerdy space but right. that's how i function so i can't apologize for it you know that's how it works yeah right that's really intensive where you want to dig up all the aspects of that person is that what you mean especially because i've read some of your interviews and i thought this um uh let's say kamila shamsi or even there was the uh, adarsh gavarav all of these people you are bringing out a lot of abstract concepts that they've well see for kamila it's different like when you're interviewing someone for a specific book like the kamila interview was for a book it's easy you read that book and you that read one other books of that person but the bulk of the interview is about that i think it gets more complicated when say you're interviewing say you know for vogue i interviewed some actors for the cover so if you're interviewing like mm. didya palan there's no you know it's or frida pinto it's a 3000 word interview with frida pinto who's who's had many firsts for india it's not going to just be about slum dog millionaire right it's right. about her life where she grew up where is she now you know all of that so i think when there isn't actually a fixed peg when there isn't like one book or one event one mm-hmm. award um right. i think then the it kind of gets broader and even the research is kind of broader uh, and you kind of need to figure where you want to take it but i actually love doing interviews i think uh, speaking to artists and writers especially i mean creative people um even though i'm a writer say i'm not an artist but speaking to any kind of creative person understanding how their creative process works understanding their schedule understanding their space what inspires them i i'm genuinely interested and i feel that when and as an interviewer when you are genuinely interested in <laughs> knowing what uh, the answer to what you're asking it shows you know and there's an energy uh, i mean you know we are doing this online and during during covid of course we've all gotten so used to just right. online interactions but when you're meeting people in person there is an energy um, i've i've done interviews and i've been interviewed and honestly you can tell when it's just empty flattery you can tell when someone hasn't actually engaged with your work or read your work and they're just asking some internet questions you can tell so i'll i would like not to be that person and uh, right thankfully i usually uh, yeah i pick people to interview that i want to and uh, <laughs> so it's a great process for me as well yeah i feel i learn after, at the end of every interview you know i feel enriched so okay so now coming to your book the illuminated that came out last year i think around october and it's been published with harper collins i think that's really something amazing because penguin harper collins all of these big publishers are something that are really i mean people like us are truly starry eyed to read all these books and i've been through your book and there's a lot of similarity between how the times are going right now and the book it's so empowering especially for a young girl like me to read it how the characters journey throughout the book throughout their lives do you think there was a thread uh, that connected your non fiction to your fiction has it helped you to write the book um you know well as a journalist i i did do i was interested in you know some uh, kind of certain women's issues women's stories but I wouldn't really say there's a song, strong thread in terms of theme. I wrote mostly a lot about art and books and then I was editing. I was editing, you know, I was a young editor so I was kind of editing from the age of I think 32. So as an editor you have to be very broad based. You can't say I'm only going to work in this space, right? Mm-hmm. Um I actually feel that writing fiction is is quite at odds with writing non-fiction. So in the sense that i don't think being a journalist helped me in being a fiction writer mm-hmm. i think there was a lot of unlearning to do because the things that are important in journalism you know getting the facts right um having a point of view uh having a beginning a uh, middle and a conclusion being clear uh, not being ambiguous all of the things that are important in journalism uh i think are at odds with writing fiction because writing fiction requires you to 
really go into the unknown it requires you to break away from structures break away move away from facts and kind of explore the gray space in between black and white uh, so i feel that my journey from writing like do, being a journalist to writing fiction was actually unlearning a lot and trying to right. inhabit this gray space trying to inhabit this idea of just driving in the dark and not knowing where you're going which is not what you do as a journalist i mean of course mm -hmm. in investigative journalism you're trying to get to the truth so right you don't know what the end is but you do have a you, you do have a path charted out you know you're going to speak to this this mm -hmm. person this is an end goal you know it, even when it's empirical there is a process and fiction is about for me at least it was about letting go of all of that so right there wasn't a direct thread but i but i do feel as a person as a woman and and that will always reflect in anything you write including your journalism i have been interested in you know say violence against women or or women mm -hmm. agency uh you know a kind of a gender disparity so the issues in my book or class um have interested me as a person i, I don't think any fiction writer you know you can't really write a 400 page book on on issues or on things or on characters that yeah you're not interested in so uh, they were definitely part of me yeah but i don't really see a direct thread between my journalism and fiction yeah right so would you say that journalism is more about journeying out and finding out things according to a process that's been followed uh since i your past times a process that's been written out and that's quite defined on the other hand writing fiction would be i mean going inwards and finding out what you think the truth is is that what you that's saying? a beautiful way aditi to put it yeah that's a, that's a lovely way to put it i do feel it's about fact versus truth actually journalism is about fact um whereas fiction is about truth and truth is you know in a kind of venn diagram like uh, truth is bigger than fact like fact is a part of truth but there yeah. is something you know that whether it's spirituality or art or fiction where we are trying to get to some kind of a universal truth and also there are things that you can say in fiction um bigger truths that i feel you can't say in journalism you know there are certain say human traits or or real evil or real darkness of the soul that you can reveal in fiction that you can't in in journalism in journalism yeah okay you've been a full time writer for quite some time now i think it's been 2 years that's right? not very long very little time yeah <laughs> the age i am in it feels like a really long time <laughs> yeah so the question was what was your schedule while being a journalist how has it changed now the way you work oh, how do you... i don't advise you know people to suddenly quit their jobs if they've been working for very long because it really kind of sets your rhythm you know that's who i was i woke up i ate a hurried breakfast i went to office i came back i was exhausted i went to some yoga class or went for a walk i ate dinner i watched tv when i was writing the book i wrote my book at night so there was a routine right um right. it was very hectic days but it was a routine you knew what to do and mm -hmm. i when i quit my job in october 2020 i had almost uh, i mean to be told i had finished writing the book right so there was some editing for the next 6 months but it was done so mm -hmm. i had these kind of unstructured days and it was also covid um Mm. right october 2 yeah it was also covid so yeah it was it's been strange i mean now i know we're coming out of covid but the bulk of my time this unstructured time as a full time writer has been in covid so you're kind of at home a lot uh, you're missing kind of any outside nutrition even exercise because there was a whole time in covid when we were afraid and not at all going out and honestly writing any kind of writing is not about just sitting at your desk and writing for 18 hours a day you know yeah it's about all the things that you do um in between it's what you do before and after it's about all the other creative nutrition that you get so i feel like my answer would be very imbalanced right now because the last two years have been so mm -hmm. strange um but i realized early on that this complete you know this kind of idea of infinite time ahead of me to write the next book was actually getting very overwhelming 
and mm-hmm. i didn't want i didn't want a full time job but i felt i needed something to just structure my day so i since my next i knew what my next book was about it's it's about an artist i kind of um i i picked short term consultancy jobs uh in the art space so you know i i i worked on this India's first NFT art website uh, earlier this year, which was fun. It was called Terrain. dot com. Uh, so that was okay. great. Now I'm working with this upcoming cultural institution in Bombay. So that's that's not like that's not an all encompassing job. You know, mm-hmm, it doesn't mm-hmm. take up twelve hours of my day or like all my brain space, but it helps me kind of you know. It ensures I wake up in the morning, have <laughs> this morning call. <laughs> you know uh, it gives me like a little bit of a structure to the day so that's helpful yeah right so when you say you can't uh, just be sitting on your desk for 16 hours and writing so you say that experiences that you take around the time of your writing are actually very vital to what you're putting into your piece. absolutely what you're reading the conversations you're having uh I mean, in today's day and age, I would also honestly, it's what you're watching as well. Uh, you know, all of that I think is 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 very important part of a writer's life. It's not you. You might sit on your desk for fourteen hours and not write a lot of stuff, but you might have a great, very stimulating day and sit mm-hmm. for two hours and write amazing pages, right? So I think it's about all those experiences taking you to a place of kind of uh, which which is. conducive to right creativity yeah so what you do and i think this is true for anyone right are uh, not just writers for for engineering yes students, for, for teachers i mean if you're going to just be in a bubble and all your conversations are just with uh you know that same circle of people um uh, that's all you see here do then you're not really going to grow so yeah Exactly, just doing the same thing on repeat again and again will really not lead you anywhere. You need yes. to break out of what you're doing on loop to actually find something different. Yes, right. So we spoke about finding the truth in fiction. Um, while writing your book, while writing your features, do you think that you always had an end moral uh, decided beforehand? or was it something that you were just you know seeing two meters ahead and you're like okay this is what i see right now i'm going to go with this right uh that's a good question aditi and it kind of links back to what we spoke about earlier since you know our fiction is about exploring the new it's about diving into the unknown a writer i really like jonathan franzen said you know in an interview that any fiction that is not the writer's personal um dive into the unknown is not worth writing for anything other than money and i believe that so it is about discovering it's about real empiricism in the way it's about discovering things along the way uh so you can't have a fixed goal or you and i don't i mean i feel most good fiction whether um you know whether it's movies or um uh sin uh whether it's cinema or poetry or, or or book i'm saying any good art um should not have a single moral conclusion uh it should take the reader to a place and then leave them there to to discover um what they want to um uh, fiction shouldn't be telling you how to think or giving you a very neatly tied moral conclusion saying this is good this is bad because then you don't need fiction you know Right. Like an essay. So yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting answer. It's very contrary to how we've been taught to, you know, write stories or any kind of writing work that we've done at school or at a college level. There's always like, okay, this is the starting. There has to be some kind of conflict. This is the middle where it reaches the highest pitch, and this is the end where there's an re- there's actually a resolution of how the characters are living. uh do you think even th- uh, while writing do you decide that flow or that is valid for a certain kind of audience right like if you see children's stories uh, someone i was just having a discussion with a german friend yesterday and you know mm-hmm. we were talking about how the grim brothers you know we think of, we've read such watered down versions of stories but the original grimm's fairy tales were so dark and what he was telling me was but think of your folk tales right think of the stories that your 
grandmother told you or even think of the mahabharat that you heard as a kid they are pretty dark there is violence there's mm. killing there is all of that but when there is a resolution it's okay for a ch- child also so it's not yeah. like all children's stories have to be sanitized there can't be anything but children need resolution so there is a format what you're talking about you know the the beginning middle end a, a children's story needs a resolution why is stories which are stories for young adults need a moral because you're still um, you know you're trying to teach things why are these stories mm-hmm. but we are adults now and our stories are meant to move beyond and introduce us to new things so we can't be writing books for adults as if they are children so i think that's that's the essential difference that the format changes the the reason that the story is being written changes right yeah religion i mean most mythological stories or religion is also a story and mm. they do have morals and the bad guy is punished and the good guy wins blah blah it's because it wants you there's a purpose to that religion or mythology wants you to think of someone as a good person and bad person they want you to believe in good and evil so the story has to be built that way but i have right. to think as a fiction writer in this century that i'm not trying to push forth an agenda i'm getting people to experience things experience joy see themselves in the story i'm not pushing an agenda so it doesn't have to follow a format right yeah that is truly the difference between how it's written for children how it's written for adults especially the good movies that we've seen i realize that a lot uh, uh the things that we don't see as you know critically good movies are always something that there's a means to meet an end so there has to be a resolution point somewhere on the other hand like you're saying good writing good movies have always given us that you know this means to connect with emotions that we even didn't know that were there with experiences that we didn't know that we could experience i think that is the gist of it right yeah okay so like you said a lot of good reading has to be put into writing good pieces right so what are you reading now what is your advice for readers uh so i think broad advice for everyone is read a lot read what you like there is no you know i don't think there's any need to be ashamed of uh, you know saying i don't read literary fiction i i read crime i think read whatever you like but for me as a writer the reading now has a dual purpose i i read what i like but i'm also reading um for work um you know since my next book is about an artist i mentioned i'm actually reading a lot of books mm-hmm. about artists um uh from different periods of history uh you know um it, it's not so that it's not to get ideas it's to see what's been done in fact it's it's to see what's been done so that your book doesn't do that again uh but it's also kind of to get into a space um but uh, yeah i would just say so what i'm reading right now is the blazing world by siri huswit she is an american writer who writes a lot about kind of psychology art and the intersection of and and kind of feminism and the intersection of all of this it's a fascinating book um and and on average at any time i'm reading like uh, not one book but a few books in parallel and uh, i'm reading this beautiful book of poetry uh, called uh, the cane groves of the narmada river which is a compilation of sanskrit erotic poetry it's it's really really beautiful it's a small i think it's a penguin or an lf like a special kind of edition um so i really like that and i've just i mean it's a book that i really wanted to read for a long time but i never had the bandwidth to to chew on such a big project but i am reading the gene by siddharth mukherjee as well so these are the three things that i have going on right now but my advice would be to read what you want to be uh, i mean uh, read what you want to read and not kind of you know get swayed by what's winning awards or what makes me a smarter mm-hmm. person um reading fiction especially is not for information it's it's for pleasure it's for joy it's to discover things and uh, how will you discover things if you're kind of you know just stuck in the small mm-hmm. bubble of what is safe so go out and experiment a lot especially young readers you know the the listeners of this podcast who are as you are in their young 20s read widely and then eventually you'll figure that these are the writers you like or this is the genre you like and once you 
really figure that out, you can go deeper into it. But I think for readers who are just starting out, it's better to be broader. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. breadth is better than depth, basically. Yeah. What I see in modern readers is that they either want to read only self-help books because, you know, it's like, okay, the mantra for success, the monk who sold his Ferrari. It's like books that promise some kind of magic that we're going to get you from this point to this point. However, I have been quite an avid reader since a very young age. I've been a member of the British Library in Pune for a very, very long time. And I don't think there has been anything more eye-opening than fiction, especially classic books that I have read, like, let's say, Little Women um, or, uh, I mean, even Harry Potter sometimes. Your book, immensely inspiring. Uh, so do you think it's right to just go, you know, self-help, self-help, (laughs) self-help? Um, so, you know, I think there's been a lot of thinking on this topic recently, bunch of articles, both in the Indian and international media, because, uh, um, in India, I think there's a trend that sales of nonfiction books have gone up, but sales of fiction has gone down. And I think it's because people are reading with the sense, you know, people are told that books improve your mind, you know, when mm. kids are to read an improving book. So this idea that there has to be a direct takeaway, you read a book and you have to learn something, uh, is what has led to this. Uh, there are people who need self-help books, uh, you know, there is an audience for them, so I don't want to take away from that. Uh, but it needs to be broader. You can't only read self-help books. Mm-hmm. And I think I think it brings us back to what do you read for? What is fiction for? What are books for? It's to journey, you know. It's to let you travel without leaving your home. It's to meet characters that you would never meet in your uh, real life. It's to build empathy because you're meeting these characters. Or it's just for fun. You know, it, it, can, it can be stimulating in ways. It could be funny. So... You know, it comes from that same kind of thinking when you tell a child that you have to learn a musical instrument because it makes you better at maths. Right. You know, have you heard that? Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Instrument makes you better at maths. Why? But playing a musical instrument should, okay, that's a side benefit, but you should play it just also because music is wonderful and playing an instrument is great for you, you know? So why do we always have to look at this kind of secondary, bigger meaning to things? I think right. reading is, is in this today's day and age when all of us have a problem with focus. I think mm-hmm. also reading books can help you build focus, you know, help you to, you know, uh, yeah. not just be on your phone and scrolling and looking at 10 minute, you know, 10 minute TikTok videos. So I think there are many benefits, but the top, you know, I think the first thing I would say is that you have to remove this idea of benefit. Mm, um, exactly. Exactly. To read a book. To know. read a book, exactly. Um, last but not the least, I know this is a very, very cliche question, but what is your advice for aspiring journalists and writers? Uh, it's not a cliched question. I think it's a valid question, but journalists and writers are two separate categories. Uh, so for journalists, I would actually say that, you know, um, If you know early on, uh, some people do, some don't, what you want to write about. Like if you know you're going to be a business journalist, uh, pure practical advice is that I would really suggest studying economics or studying, doing an undergrad in business and then doing a master's in journalism because as such, journalistic skills can be picked up even on the job or in a short diploma program. Mm -hmm. But the subject area expertise that you have when you have a good undergrad in, say, statistics, because data journalism is a big thing now, right? Right. Um, Or when you have good grounding in theory. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to be, you know, a science reporter, having, you know, just a BSc in, in, say, biology or chemistry, I think having that kind of grounding is very useful. And also, um, this is my uh, personal belief as somebody who's, only worked at, I would say I've been lucky to work at good brand name places, but it was also my belief while hiring that I think it's better to not work um, if, if that's possible for you, then work at a bad place or work at a bad team. Because when you work at a substandard place, you if that's your first job, you actually pick up bad habits, mm-hmm. uh, which, which take years to unlearn. So when I was hiring journalists, uh, you know, I would prefer a fresh grad over somebody who's worked two years in a substandard place because they've learned bad work ethics. Right. Which takes a long time to kind of let go. Uh, So, yeah, I guess my advice would be to 
if you know what you want to specialize in then to study that well mm-hmm. and uh, in turn in good places and yeah up and work with the kind of editors and reporters who you admire whose stories you like that's where you should apply for jobs and uh, be honest and truthful and do not base your stories on google research you <laughs> know i think that helps and also having writing samples early on helps so whether it's a college newsletter or you know you've submitted articles to a journal or a student mm-hmm. journal i think it it helps to show uh, to kind of demonstrate that you've been interested in this for a while you know you can't at 22 suddenly graduate and apply for a job and say i want to be a journalist and have no evidence of being right. interested in this space ever mm-hmm. before so um start with whatever is available and start early uh, for writers my advice i mean for creative writers my advice would actually be uh, it's much more simple it's to read read and read. read read good books read very widely and that's the best education you have yeah okay thank you so much for doing this interview with us it was such a stimulating hour for me to talk to you i think that is why tech people <laughs> are out here interviewing creative people because that's not something that we get out here easily <laughs> i think tech can be creative i've heard coding can be quite creative right yes but like you said uh, for writers if you're constantly <laughs> on your desk in front of your laptop and constantly writing that it'll just put you in the same loop similarly for us you put us on a loop in coding it's going to be <laughs> quite a mess in our heads right so yeah thank you so much for doing this interview with us thank you so much for watching this video with i to be pune's podcast beyond conversation this is anandita's book the illuminated it is an extremely nuanced work of fiction and a truly cathartic read You can find the link to buy the book in the description below. Also, you can find all her work links at her website, which we've also linked below. If you like this video, please do like, share and comment and please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much. Signing off.